September the 15th, 1990, the unique sound of Merlin engines is heard over London as Spitfire and Hurricane fighters celebrate a famous victory. September the 30th, 1938, Neville Chamberlain returns to London bearing a peace treaty signed by Hitler. Morning. I had another talk with the German Chancellor, Herr Hitler. And here is the paper which bears his name upon it as well as mine. The treaty was, of course, worthless. Within the year, German Stuka bombers took off to attack Poland. The Second World War had begun. This is London. The following official communique has been issued from 10 Downing Street. On September the 1st, His Majesty's Ambassador in Berlin was instructed to inform the German government that unless they were prepared to give His Majesty's government in the United Kingdom satisfactory assurances that the German government had suspended all aggressive action against Poland, and were prepared promptly to withdraw their forces from Polish territory, His Majesty's government in the United Kingdom would, without hesitation, fulfill their obligations to Poland. I have to tell you now that no such undertaking has been received and that consequently this country is at war with Germany. The unprovoked and undeclared war against Poland was witness to the terrifying development of mechanized war, the skilled integration of air power, armor, artillery, and motorized troops. It brought a new word to the military lexicon, blitzkrieg, lightning war. Poland was crushed in a little over three weeks, swiftly followed by Denmark, Norway, Holland, and Belgium. And despite a massive army and a huge air force, France itself was overcome in a matter of days. As the German army rolled across France at the speed of its tanks, the British Expeditionary Force retreated. A few heavily outnumbered RAF squadrons in France sustained grievous losses, trying to stem the enemy advance, to no avail. The British army was neither trained nor equipped to fight this new war of mobility, although in fact it owed much to the writings of a prescient British officer, Captain Little Hart. Spearheaded by the screaming Stuka dive bombers, the relentless German advance continued until they reached the sea and the German frontier to the Atlantic coast had taken less than three weeks. What was left of the British Army was cornered at a seaside town named Dunkirk. Dunkirk was not a victory. The Germans were celebrating that. It was, however, a deliverance. Over 320,000 Allied troops lived to fight another day. Hitler was convinced that the war was over. Once Churchill saw reason, or the strength of the German forces available to attack and occupy England. We were on the very brink of total defeat. In one of his less frequently quoted speeches just after Dunkirk, when the Germans sat poised across the channel, waiting for the kill, Churchill said of the RAF, could it be that the cause of civilization itself would be defended by the skills of a few thousand airmen? As he saw so clearly, the battle about to break over Britain was a battle of a quite different sort, fought entirely in the air, fought by relatively few men, above all a battle so decisive that we couldn't afford to lose it. It was a question of survival. If we avoided defeat, we bought time to fight another day. If the Germans won, then the invasion would surely follow and the war in Europe would be over. And remember, we stood alone. Europe had gone, America still sat on the sidelines. And all that stood between Britain and defeat was a thin blue line of fighter squadrons at airfields like this one at North Wild in Essex, stretched along our southern and eastern flanks. Now, Goring had convinced Hitler he could smash that line in a matter of days, and he set out to prove it. What General Wagon called the Battle of France is over. I expected the Battle of Britain is about to begin. The whole fury and might of the enemy must very soon be turned on us. Hitler knows that he will have to break us in this island or lose the war. Ranged against the RAF were three Luftwaffe air fleets, 930 fighters, over 1,000 twin-engine bombers, and more than 300 Stuka dive bombers. 
German pilots and aircrew were by then experienced in combat, battle-hardened, and to a man totally confident of their ability to crush the RAF. There is no doubt the fortunes of this battle turned essentially on the qualities of the three major fighters involved. How they fared in combat determined to a large extent whether or not the bombers got through to their target. And the fighters were remarkably closely matched. The Messerschmitt 109, for example, could easily outrun the Hurricane. But the Hurricane had a tighter turn, it was a superbly balanced gun platform and a very tough plane indeed. The Spitfire had the beatings of the Messerschmitt in a dogfight, but it didn't have the benefit of the Messerschmitt's fuel-injected engine, which enabled it to drop its nose and dive away to safety. The fact is, the pilots of both sides had a profound respect for their opponent's machines and for each other. The Messerschmitt 109E was a most formidable fighter. The prototype had flown in September 1935, powered incidentally by a Rolls-Royce engine. Production 109s went into action in Spain in 1937, and by 1940, it was the principal German fighter. The Hawker Hurricane first flew just two months after the Messerschmitt. During the fighting in France, Hurricanes had fought against the Luftwaffe, and German pilots soon respected this very rugged and manoeuvrable fighter. During the coming battle, Hurricanes would destroy more enemy aircraft than all other aircraft and guns put together. The Supermarine Spitfire came into squadron service as late as June 1938, just in time in fact. It was faster than the Hurricane and could outturn the Messerschmitt at any altitude. It was destined to become the outstanding symbol of Britain standing alone during that long summer of 1940. During the Battle of Britain there were just 46 squadrons of RAF fighters, two-thirds of them Hurricanes, and the total strength of RAF fighter command never exceeded 700 serviceable aircraft. And at the outset, the vast majority of RAF pilots had no combat experience. That summer was perfect, day after day of hot sunshine and cloudless skies, soon to be a vast battlefield. The scene was set. RAF fighters were serviced and endlessly checked by ground crews proud of their fighter and their pilot. The Battle of Britain is now considered to have been fought from July the 16th, when Hitler issued his directive to smash the Royal Air Force, and the end of October. But the dates are arbitrary. It had no clear beginning or indeed end. The German purpose was nothing less than to sweep the RAF from the sky in order to clear the way for their invasion fleets. The prime targets were the fighter airfields and the aircraft factories. But the battle ranged far and wide across England, from ports and harbours in the north to the coastal towns in the south. And the odds were very much in the enemy's favour, from the overwhelming number of aircraft to the skill and experience and confidence of their air crews. From the outset, there seemed little chance that the slender forces of the RAF fighter squadrons could resist a long and sustained assault. The Germans had completely underestimated the immense value of British radar, which they thought too primitive to be effective. They dismissed also the RAF's highly developed system of ground control. They believed quite wrongly that it would inhibit the freedom of the British fighter pilots. And they knew nothing of the activities of the British codebreakers, whose shadowy contribution to the battle is still far from clear. But all in the end depended on the skill and resolve of a thousand or so young men, the fighter pilots of the RAF, many of whom had come straight from flying schools. There was no learning curve, only the straight line of kill or be killed. In air combat, there are no grades, no classes. Once the battle is joined, all are considered equal. Though inevitably, some become more equal than others.
Throughout the summer, the battle raged. The attacks on the airfields were the most damaging, and losses were high on both sides. By early September, Hitler was so sure of victory, he set the actual date for the invasion. During August, the rate of attrition of RAF fighters was so great that ground crews worked round the clock to keep the fighters serviceable. And a good crew could refuel and rearm a Spitfire in under 15 minutes. Battle-scarred aircraft were patched up and sent back into the fray in a matter of hours. Young WAFs in the vital fighter control rooms stayed at their posts hour after hour, even when under attack. But throughout that long summer, now 50 years ago, the pilots who returned shrugged off the damage to their fighters and their own fatigue, and refused to admit the possibility of defeat. He's lost them all. Yeah, the one he got back, didn't he? Yeah. I saw him crash into the sea and the crew got away in a rubber dinghy. Swell, that's 111 definitely destroyed. And uh, I've got a search 110. Oh, nice work. Saw the two chaps bail out. Mm-hmm. Around 2,000 there. Yes, and one of their parachutes, unfortunately, or fortunately, didn't open. Aha. Uh -huh. Sortie followed sortie. Pilots returned to the battle three or four times a day. War without end. The Luftwaffe too were proving to be mortal after all. For them, the bitter taste of the unthinkable, defeat. Pilots nursed their shot up bombers back to bases in France, the lucky ones that is. At the height of the battle, Luftwaffe were losing 40 or more bombers in a single day. The fighters too, though they suffered fewer losses than the bombers, found the RAF a different proposition from the heady days of easy victories against Polish biplanes. On paper, the RAF didn't exist, yet somehow there were always fighters waiting to attack the bomber fleets and their escorts. Even Goering began to admit that things were going badly. German fighter ace General Adolf Galland. Goering came out to our airfields in France. He was met at us fighter pilots because we did not succeed in giving sufficient defense to our bomber squadrons against British fighters. When Erich Goering asked me what he could do about it, I replied, get me Spitfires for my wing. The legend of the Spitfire was being created on both sides. Throughout the battle, much depend on the aircraft factories. They alone replenished the squadrons and kept them in the battle. Between August the 24th and September the 6th, Dowding lost no less than 466 of his precious fighters. By mid-September, the battle had reached its climax. On Sunday the 15th, Goering set out to deliver what he believed would be the final hammer blow to the RAF. Every available bomber and fighter was to be thrown into the assault. He had already transferred the bulk of his Messerschmitt fighters from Scandinavia to France. Over 600 of them were now based just across the channel only 25 minutes flying time away. At the RAF fighter airdromes, it was clear from early dawn that it was going to be another tough day for the fighter pilots. The sky was clear, the weather was settled, and from early dawn, reports began to come in of great activity across the channel. A squadron after squadron of German aircraft began to assemble over the French coast. But quite apart from the signals on the radar screens, British intelligence that penetrated the German plans, and fighter command was ready. It knew that the attack would come in two huge waves, one in the morning, a second in the afternoon. When the battle came, Dowding was prepared to commit his very last reserves. So crucial was this day, in fact, that Winston Churchill himself chose to observe the fighter pilots in action and the progress of the battle in the skies over southern England from number 10 Group Operations Control Room at Uxbridge. Every last fighter in southern England was committed to the battle. When Churchill posed his famous question, what reserves have we, the reply came, there are none. 
By late evening on that day, it was clear that a great victory had been won. Air Ministry communicate. The biggest bag yet. 185 enemy aircraft shot down. Seven of them by anti-aircraft guns. And the remainder by our fighters. 131 of the enemy aircraft were bombers. End of message. Well, hindsight has since revealed that those figures were grossly exaggerated. Historians now put the German losses on the day at little more than a third of that total. But it matters not. The actual losses were still heavy enough to convince Hitler that despite all the long summer days of the battle, the RAF was nowhere near defeat. The thin blue line had held. On the 7th of September 1940, Churchill had put out an alert, invasion imminent. On the 17th, Hitler ordered the postponement of Operation Sea Lion indefinitely, and it was never reinstated. So those great air battles of the 15th September had truly proved to be the turning of the tide. Of course, the battle wasn't over. It dragged on well into October. But appalled by his immense losses of aircrew and planes by day, Hitler now ordered his bombing fleets to terrorise Britain by night, and Londoners had to face the ordeal of the Blitz. The night Blitz was, for those who experienced it, terrifying. It was the first large-scale, indiscriminate attack on a city. It would not be the last. By the end of the year, 13,000 Londoners had been killed and 16,000 badly injured. The damage to property was massive. But it was the final phase. In effect, it signalled the end of the battle we now celebrate as the Battle of Britain. In a sense, these old fighter aerodromes like Northweald and Biggin Hill, Debden and Duxford and Tangmere and the rest are like huge silent war memorials to the men who flew so bravely from them 50 years ago. Because what we mustn't forget is that the battle that raised in these skies in the summer of 1940 was one of the greatest battles in history, a battle that will ring down the ages like those of Agincourt and Trafalgar. And the celebration of the 15th September is really a tribute to all who took part, the pilots, the men who armed and serviced the planes, the women who manned the radar stations and the control rooms, and the civilians who endured the fire and the bombs. To everyone's relief, the 15th of September 1990 dawned bright and clear with only a light wind out of the west. A dawn indeed, not unlike that of the 15th of September 1940, a day made for flying. At airfields from Wadisham and Bryce Norton in the south to Coningsby in the north, aircraft stood range along the dispersal aprons. A handful of ground crew carry out their final checks in the peace and quiet of the early morning. No one wants an aircraft not to start on a day like this. Buccaneers from Lossy Mouth, Phantoms from Wadisham and Lucas and Wildenrath in West Germany. Sixteen are taking part in this flight past to represent the squadrons of Phantoms still flying with the RAF as air defence fighters. Every one of them has as much power in its twin Rolls-Royce engines as a whole squadron of Spitfires. This flight past is a huge tribute to all those who took part in the Battle of Britain, the biggest display of British fighting planes since 1953 for the coronation of Queen Elizabeth II. Indeed, its like may never be seen again. An aircraft had been brought in from every corner of the RAF's operations. 
This Nimrod crew, for example, will be flying over 500 miles back to Kinloss directly after the flight passed, hence the need to take care of the inner man. And the scale of the operation is immense. Getting 163 aircraft of every different size and shape and age and power from the World War II Lancaster to the powerful Phantoms into seven neatly spaced formations passing over Buckingham Palace in one smooth six-minute stream calls for all the precision of a bombing mission. And the briefing is no less detailed. The fly past is to be led by Air Vice Marshal Bill Ratton, Commander of 11 Group, and based at Bentley Priory in Middlesex, from where, of course, the fighters in the Battle of Britain were controlled. Weather wide open. You can see the barbican from overhead here, just about. So we'll start up at 11.16, five minutes before that. We'll take off at 11.26, and what I'll do is exactly the same as during the rehearsals. Start, taxi without delay, out to 05. I'll pull onto the LRP, and I'll go to the far end of the LRP, so everybody just tucks in behind me. And we're finally hacking <coughs> over the IP at 11.56 local time. And we'll be looking for something like 165, 170 knots indicated all the way down. But we'll see how that works out. I'd like to be a bit faster than that, um, actually, in the overhead, just to make a, a little more throaty noise. But I won't make any violent throttle changes at the wrong minute, obviously, as I have to. Any problems in the air, as far as the radio goes, then we just stay as we are, in formation. And unless I really do um, feel that I'm not hacking the program, in which case I'll waggle, obviously, and I'll only do that if I can't talk to you. I will then expect you to appear somewhere conveniently to take the lead. But in all seriousness, I don't see that happening today. Any other problems in the air, then make your own arrangements, bearing in mind that as we leave the Stapleford Tawney uh, Fairlop area, we're entering in, into a, a built up territory. The airfields that are open, you know about. There will be nothing on their runways, we're guaranteed and there are a fair number of sufficiently open spaces around uh, for any of us suffering a serious problem to make as much height as possible, bearing in mind that the heavies are behind us and getting out of their way while recovering as best we can. So let's all leave here together for a minute's time.
Williams Will, or Woodhall Spa, or Syreston, or any of the many fields from which the Lancasters flew in the late 40s. The average life expectancy of a bomber in those dark days was not more than three missions. The chances of a bomber crew surviving its tour of 30 missions was no more than one in three.